protests that started over a rise in metro fares have provoked a state of emergency in Santiago. subway fares was enough to bring a million people to the streets. The so so quickly in a country that looks to be stable. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. You can add Chile to the list of countries dealing with political upheaval on the streets. Amongst the issues, bias on the airwaves. Journalism from behind bars. In prisons across the U.S., inmates are reporting on a hidden world. To ban or not to ban, the issue is political advertising. Social media sites are grappling with it. And the Washington Post botches an obituary headline, and the Internet is not going to let the paper live it down. Over the past month or so, we've covered mass protest movements and the way those stories have been reported from Hong Kong to Baghdad to Beirut. This week, we're looking at Chile and the largest demonstrations there since the end of the Pinochet dictatorship almost 30 years ago. The unrest was set off by a price hike on public transport, but the larger contextual issues include rising inequality plus an unrepresentative political class, news outlets included. Chile has the most concentrated media ownership in Latin America. There's a lot of resentment on the streets directed at TV channels. Accusations of too much airtime on looting, not enough on either violations by the security forces or the underlying issues behind the civil unrest. The historical backdrop is central to this story. There's a deep, lingering resentment of the news media, which goes back to the Pinochet era. Chileans remember that the fourth estate failed them utterly back then. And they're saying that journalists still aren't listening to them today. Our starting point this week is the capital, Santiago. There's a perception that journalists are not telling the truth. Disconnected to vested interests mostly private interests. Most of the protests were shot by drones from really high in the air because they would have problems with the camera in the street. Their vans would be vandalized. On one hand, you have this massive protest and they all wanted something better for the country. On the other hand, you have this terrible story of violence lootings, burning buses, burning cars, um, total destruction, chaos. And the army on the streets in a state of emergency. And that, of course, reminds everyone from what happened in Chile in the 70s and 80s, the dictatorship. Everybody knows how it started, and nobody knows for sure how will it end. What began as a spontaneous protest over the rising cost of a subway ticket in Santiago has morphed into a national movement that wants to talk about a much bigger issue, inequality in Chile. Starting in the mid-1970s, the country went down the neoliberal path, embarking on a privatization binge the money markets approved of. But it left citizens having to shell out for a range of privatized services, education, health care, pensions, which many Chileans say do not deliver enough. The richest 1% holds more than a quarter of the country's wealth. They are well positioned to affect, if not control, the news narrative. Nowhere in Latin America is media ownership as concentrated as it is in Chile, which partly explains why the conflicts on the streets are not limited to protesters taking on security forces. Those protesters are also targeting journalists. Television channels and mainstream radio have not carried balanced coverage and haven't reported the ill feeling on the streets. What TV channels have done is to remain on the side of the ruling class, opinion makers and experts. But what is the underlying issue? is that the neoliberal, neo-capitalist model is at the expense of social rights. Rights that were stolen during the dictatorship and which remained hijacked as neoliberalism was deepened by our democratic governments. 
What has happened here is enormous protests fueled by social outrage, and the media has felt bewildered. They don't know how to manage the situation. This is a movement that doesn't have leaders controlling the masses, so who represents them? Who can journalists dialogue with? How can TV manage, process and present this social movement? We have to remember that almost the entire media in Chile belongs to private corporations. That kind of power is present in the way they control the media. So even when a journalist is trying to show or depict a kind of image of the mobilization, ultimately what people perceive is that these vested interests are manufacturing the kind of news and the kind of portray of any type of uh, mobilization. A recurring grievance of protesters is the Chilean media's emphasis on conflict at the expense of context. They accuse privately owned channels such as Megavision and Channel 13 of feasting on images of looting and violence, while starving audiences of analysis of the underlying causes of the unrest. The agendas at play are not merely ideological. They are commercial too, the ratings chase. And TVN, the national broadcaster, is no different. Like other state-owned institutions in Chile, it has had a neoliberal makeover. TVN is reliant on ad revenues in a way public broadcasters in other countries are not, leading to coverage that leans towards the sensational. The first days when you were seeing or watching the news, I remember very clearly the screen divided in two. This was TVN probably. On one side of the screen you had a fire in the street. And this went on for hours, this fire on the screen. The most important thing visually was this fire. And what does it mean fire in a context like this? It means riots, it means danger. The form of media that dominates Chile's streets is social. It's where protesters organize, get their news, and share stories of news coverage that fall short. And it isn't just domestic news outlets and reporters feeling the heat. Foreign journalists are too. Announced a hike in the metro. Fair. Al Jazeera's correspondent, Teresa Bow, was targeted after this live hit. Stuck at the fringes of a protest for technical reasons, she had demonstrators going after her, not for anything she said, but because of what her camera was showing. <laughs> The anti-Bo social media campaign was aggressive, complete with death threats. She left the country after being assaulted on the street. You can see in Facebook and Twitter and Instagram all these hashtags like don't trust journalists, basically don't trust the elite, turn off the TV, apaga la tele, or turn off this particular station. There is this anger. People in the streets say, oh, you know, you're not covering this, you're not covering that, but you cannot expect a TV station, a traditional news outlet to behave as a social media, showing everything at the same moment, in the same way. So it's, it's very challenging. And there is a lack of trust in elites, and the media belongs to the elite. Looming over the media story in Chile is some dark history, the Pinochet dictatorship, which lasted from 1973 until 1990. And the country's oldest, best-selling newspaper, El Mercurio, has more to answer for than most. In the early 70s, the paper was bankrolled by the CIA, paid millions of dollars to produce stories to destabilize the democratically elected government of leftist president Salvador Allende. It then went on to cover up brutal human rights violations committed by the Pinochet regime, which killed thousands of Chileans. Many of the demonstrators have long memories, and it's no wonder that the paper's offices in the coastal city of Valparaiso were broken into and set alight. The media are always being asked about their support for the 1973 coup, and El Mercurio is being asked when they will do their mea culpa. They haven't done it till now, and they're not going to do it. So we need to know what perspective does this right-wing media outlet have on reality? Is it trying to maintain the economic model? 
Is it trying to protect its business interests? Is it trying to retain its privilege and hegemony within the media system? We have come from a dictatorship where the military had an important role. This is a memory, a painful memory. The attack against Al Mercurio is symbolic. It is a very important newspaper in Chile associated with a right-wing movement that was in line with Pinochet. You cannot talk about Chile without knowing what Al Mercurio has said. Days into the demonstrations, President Sebastian Piñera declared a state of emergency while surrounded by men in uniform. It was a sharp visual reminder, as though Chileans needed one, of the past. Later, appearing before the live cameras, Piñera added a declaration of war against the demonstrators, one in which journalists are more than just collateral damage. The Media Watch NGO Reporters Without Borders says media workers have been arbitrarily and violently arrested, targeted with tear gas, and shot at with rubber bullets and live ammunition. <laughs> But unlike 1973, this time, everybody has a phone, a camera, and a chance to tell the story. So you have tons of footage of people reporting in the streets, shooting what's happening. And you have to put this in a large context. It's the one of 1973 and the coup d'etat. If we, in seven days, we have this tons of footage showing atrocities committed by the police officers and soldiers. Can you imagine the level of violence committed at that time? We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Johanna Hoos. Joe, along with hate speech, fake accounts, misinformation, the big social media platforms have been grappling with this issue of political advertising. We've seen a lot of talk on it. Let's start with Facebook. What's the policy there, and why is the company getting so much flack over it? Well, Richard, Facebook has become an integral part of political campaigns around the world, and it gets a lot of criticism for running political ads without fact-checking them. CEO Mark Zuckerberg was questioned last month at a congressional hearing in Washington, and this is how he defended Facebook's policy. In a democracy, okay. I believe that people should be able to see for themselves what politicians that they may or may not vote for so are you saying won't take judge them their down. character for themselves. Zuckerberg also denied that Facebook's hands-off policy was designed with ad revenues in mind. He said political ads will account for just 0.5% of Facebook's overall ad revenues next year. But still, if you break that down, Facebook uh, is forecasting total revenues next year of $66 billion. 0.5% of that is $300 million. Nothing to scoff at. Zuckerberg is also getting some stick from some of his own employees, a number of whom signed a letter objecting to this whole let users figure it out for themselves approach, calling it a threat to what Facebook stands for. Then Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey jumps in and he announces a policy change on that platform. No more political ads. If you look at the timing, Richard, this feels a little bit like a case of corporate trolling. While Facebook flounders on this issue, here's Twitter with what sounds like a well-thought-out policy for killing all political ads. Dorsey tweeted, political message reach should be earned, not bought, and that paying to reach voters has significant ramification that today's democratic infrastructure may not be prepared to handle. Now, across the internet, people were tagging Facebook and Zuckerberg, asking why they couldn't do the same as Twitter. But it's worth noting, though, that Twitter doesn't make nearly as much as Facebook does from political ads. So Dorsey is not turning his back on as much money. But from a PR point of view, he clearly did Zuckerberg no favors this week. OK, thanks, Joe. More than two million people live in American prisons. That's roughly equivalent to the population of a medium-sized city locked up across the country. The stories of what really goes on inside are seldom heard, which is striking since fictional depictions of prison life have proven to be more than marketable. Films like Escape from Alcatraz, Papillon, The Shawshank Redemption, more recent TV shows like Prison Break and Orange is the New Black, there's something about incarceration that seems to fascinate audiences. However, non-fictional accounts of life on the inside are much harder to come by. For journalists who have tried, access is the issue, with prison authorities usually controlling who gets in and what stories get out. 
But some prisoners are determined to make this a beat of their own. The journalism that they produce from behind bars has real value, both for audiences and the reporters involved. The inmates seem to find journalism to be a useful form of rehabilitation. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on the ultimate inside story, prison journalism in America. We rolling. Man, let's get this thing cracking. Let's y'all. get it. Bring it. it. Let's do it. What? Coming at you from the Bay of San Francisco at San Quentin State Prison. This is Uncuffed. Broadcasting from inside one of the oldest prisons in the United States, Uncuffed is a brand new radio show. Uncuffed is about telling our stories from our perspective. It's the latest product from a unique media project, San Quentin Radio, which operates out of San Quentin State Prison in California. Supported by volunteers and donations, inmates are taught how to tell their stories, how to be the chroniclers of their own experiences under lockup. And there's a market out there awash with depictions of prison life. You're not going to bang on my door, you're not going to bang on my windows, and you're not going to start any fights in there with anybody. Reality shows like America's Toughest Prisons, true crime documentary series like Making a Murderer, and dramas like Prison Break. The worst of the worst are there. Rapists, murderers. What goes in never comes out. For Troy Williams, one of the founders of the San Quentin Media Initiative, it was clear people on the outside wanted to know about life behind prison walls. So why not tell them the real thing? You watch a lot of shows that talk about prison and they never like seem to get my story right. And so that's when I came up with the idea of producing San Quentin Prison Report. And from there, things just began to, to take off. That was back in 2010, when Williams was still serving a life sentence at San Quentin for robbery and kidnapping. Using donated equipment, he began producing his own video and audio programs about life in jail. He got out in 2014 and continues to work as a producer. Williams is not an anomaly. Across the United States, there's a small press corps of prisoners telling stories that might otherwise never get told. Some write mostly for their fellow prisoners, like Kerry Myers, sentenced to life for second-degree murder, a crime that he, the victim's family, and the investigating detective all say he did not commit. He spent two decades writing and editing a magazine, The Angolite, produced out of a maximum security prison in Louisiana. His sentence was commuted, and he was released in 2016. I think I've wanted to do that, wanted to write, uh, since I was five years old. And so when I was sent to uh, Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary, they pulled me into the prison print shop where I stayed for five years. I got to know the editor, I got to know the, the rest of the staff. And when an opening came up, I certainly took, took the opportunity to do that. The Angolite is a chronicler of, of not only events that happens at the prison, but the Angolite has also been a conscience of the criminal justice system in Louisiana. And, and policies nationwide. Then there are inmates whose journalism has jumped beyond prison walls. John J. Lennon is held at the Sing Sing Correctional Facility in New York State. He's serving a 28 years to life sentence for selling drugs and murder. He writes features about life in prison for outlets like the Washington Post, the New York Review of Books, the Marshall Project, and is even a contributing editor for Esquire magazine. Story comes from character, so I'm constantly in conversation with my peers. I'm sort of taking notes, whether it be in the yard, and you know, I have my pen and pad, and I'm talking to the person, and then I'll go back to my cell, and I'll sort of transcribe those notes on my typewriter. You know, I don't even really do too much of my own research. Whenever I see a story in something, I think I'm bringing, I'm looking at this, the story is a little different from my angle, right? Of all the media setups in the US prison system right now, San Quentin is where prisoners interested in journalism want to be. There's a newspaper, San Quentin News. There's the radio show Uncuffed. You can see and feel what we see, feel and hear. And there's the hit podcast Ear Hustle. You could hear them uh, dragging handcuffs and stuff. All produced by inmates on the inside. 
And it's not just about the variety of media on offer. Prisoners at San Quentin can even get something of a journalism education from professional reporters, like former Wall Street Journal tech reporter Yukari Kane. These men have learned how to be articulate, have learned how to write well, and they have become experts in criminal justice from the inside. They're personally affected by policy and law and, and important discussions that are happening now. And, um, and there's an opportunity for them to be part of the discussion and the debate outside, uh, not just through their own articles, but through op-eds. And hearing these perspectives, giving them a space in the mainstream, is crucial. America has the highest documented incarceration rate in the world, but an acute lack of transparency around prison conditions makes coverage from the outside especially challenging. In our interviews with John J. Lennon, Kerry Myers, and Troy Williams, the key point they all kept coming back to was their access. It's unparalleled. They do the kind of reporting no one else can. We exposed the practice of a state Court of Appeal uh, that for 12 years had essentially thrown all pro se supervisory writs into the garbage can, meaning a, a, a writ that was filed, an appeal that was filed by a prisoner without a lawyer. It got exposed because the staff director committed suicide in his office and sent all the documentation to an attorney who happened to be a friend of mine. Had I been anywhere else, no one would have cared. Uh, we exposed that practice, and, and that practice uh, changed. I wrote a piece for uh, the New York, New York Magazine, and it was co-published in The Marshall Project. Andrew Goldstein is this notorious guy that suffers from schizophrenia. He was uh, psychotic 20 years ago off of his meds, and he pushed Kendra Webdale in front of the subway. And that case sort of sparked Kendra's Law, which sort of mandated uh, that uh, people with schizophrenia to take their medication and it, it gives them more help. Like I could tell this story, I could interview him and that's what I did. Prison ain't really like that. Telling these stories isn't just about good reporting and access from the inside. It's completely dependent on maintaining the trust of prison authorities. Many of the inmate journalists that we spoke to said they didn't often experience direct censorship but they did acknowledge that there are certain limits on what they can report. And those boundaries are set and monitored by prison public information officers. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison, and I approve this story. At San Quentin, Lieutenant Sam Robinson is the man with the final say. We do want the newspaper to be the voice of the man inside. And essentially, I weigh in and I make a decision on not the validity of the article, but whether there's something in it that may have an adverse impact on someone who lives here inside the prison, someone at another facility, or if it endangers public safety. Um, um, we're not here to censor, I'm not here to censor the paper. He gives us a lot of freedom to do exactly what it is that we need to do. Just because we came to prison doesn't mean that our rights and our citizenship stopped at the gate. Did I say everything right? Hold on, let me check with Sam. Sam, how did that sound? <laughs> Do you think I could be a public information officer one day? <laughs> Giving prisoners the opportunity to report their own stories isn't just a means of unraveling the complex truths of prison life. It provides a rehabilitation tool, a catharsis. For some, Journalism is a way of life behind bars. At the end of the day, I, I guess, you know, I, I would say I'm a storyteller and I look forward to telling stories. And I will say, you know, I may live in prison, but I'm no longer a criminal. It gave me an ability to think of myself outside of the box of just a prisoner. I could put out through this medium a product that could change the face of how people are viewed in prison or even how we view ourselves in prison. When you've been deprived of speaking, of talking for years on end, and someone says all of a sudden, hey man, I'm gonna tell your story. There is where the magic began. We've got the mic now. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, writing headlines can be tricky, and what you don't want to do is write one that makes headlines elsewhere for the wrong reasons. 
When the Washington Post published its obituary for Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the ISIL leader killed by American forces last week, its first headline described him as an austere religious scholar. Thousands of complaints later, the al-Baghdadi headline was transformed. Out with the scholar, in with the extremist leader. By then, though, Twitter was littered with parodies of possible post headlines and how the paper might describe a range of historical figures. We'll leave you with a few of our favorites, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.